Hello, my name is David Keane. I'm a clinical academic uh, in Leeds in the UK. I have a clinical role. I'm a, a clinical scientist within the Department of Renal Medicine, and I have an academic interest in uh, fluid management, particularly in hemodialysis, and uh, have a position in the University of Leeds as well. Today, I, I have the pleasure of talking to you about a piece of work I did in collaboration with the Renal Research Institute, um, looking at the time of onset of intradilytic hypertension and really looking about whether, whether it matters. So here are my disclosures. So I hope, I hope this analogy works um, in, in an audience outside of the UK, but, but here we, we would um, talk about whack-a-mole as well as being a, a common game in arcades as an analogy for something that's um, a problem that has, after repeated attempts to address it, it leaves people futile and unable to address a problem properly. And really this is, I think, a feeling we have around intradilytic hypertension. So although we have improved um, hemodialysis treatments enormously over the last few decades, um, it's very difficult to see how we are dealing with intradilytic hypertension as our um, populations we deal with change a little bit. Um, how we treat patients, you know, in, in terms of a very static and rigid uh, framework of the frequency and length of dialysis sessions, and also due to uh, uh, issues in the way we, we measure and record uh, episodes of intradilytic hypertension. But what, what actually is certain is that it's, it's a real problem and it's really on the agenda for, for clinicians, for, for researchers, and, and, and certainly for patients too. And it's an issue that we really need to, to try and grasp. So what do we know about intradilytic hypertension? Well, the pathophysiology is, is, is well described in the literature. And as, as a physicist by background, it's something I'm, I'm comfortable with. We can really think about things in, in terms of fluid mechanics and we can relate episodes of intradilytic hypertension to a combination of some or all of, of volume reduction. So the removal of fluid from the circulation with ultrafiltration and perhaps as well, the inability to refill from, from the interstitial fluid compartment. Also to impaired cardiac output response. So um, often we can have stunted uh, autonomic response uh, to, to volume reduction. And also to changes in peripheral resistance. So we know that, for example, dialysis will uh, result in changes, increases in core temperature in the body. And this can reduce the, the systemic vascular resistance that we have. And we can link this to, to hypertensive episodes as well. When we look at the definitions of intradialytic hypertension, if you look in the literature, um, it's very common to see paragraphs or sentences like the one we have here uh, in the introduction, where we talk about the prevalence ranging from, in this quote, 15 to 50% of, of dialysis treatments. And this can be very different depending on which paper you read. And this really highlights, I think, the, the issues we have in defining and getting a good grasp of, of what we are defining intradialytic hypertension as. The epidemiology um, of, of, of intradialytic hypertension is also pretty well described in the literature. So, so a lot of the definitions of, of IDH are related to systolic blood pressure, which is a routinely um, collected variable in most dialysis centers. So this means that in, in a lot of the um, databases we have from uh, routine uh, dialysis sessions, we have uh, the ability to, re to, to measure intradialytic hypertension and so we can have huge database epidemiological studies to look at um, associations between clinical treatment and demographic uh, factors and, and the onset of intradialytic hypertension. And finally, probably most importantly for, for patients and clinicians, interventions. So unfortunately, um, interventions um, is, is an area where we've never really had great success. So you can see on the screen a number of different things that have been tested in, in trials. So this could be uh, profiling of ultrafiltration rates um, profiling of sodium concentrations in the dialysis fluid. Um, we have in the middle, you can see a relative blood volume curve. So uh, diagnostics such as uh, 
blood volume monitoring and things like bioimpedance to, to help us um, optimally set patients' target rates and prescribe food removal. We've tested things, medications such as, as midogen and, and other, other therapies to try and help us manage the um, cardiovascular response to fluid removal. And unfortunately, the vast majority of these trials, we've really struggled to, to show um, benefit from, from many of these interventions. The one, the one intervention um, uh, which, which has a, a lot of promise and we have managed to have some promising trials around is, is modification of the dialysis fluid. So if we, if we change the temperature of the dialysis fluid, we can try and offset some of the problems relating to, to loss of systemic resistance there, uh, which I mentioned earlier. And this, this has great promise, although hasn't yet been fully um, adopted into, into routine care in, in a lot of the world. So the question is, where do we go from here? There's, there's an awful lot of research uh, put into describing and um, looking at intradialytic hypertension, but, but the question is, what more can we do? From my clinical background, um, I, I'm very aware that we would clinically um, deal with intradialytic hypertension very differently if we are looking at the, an episode that occurs right at the start of a dialysis session to an episode that occurs at the end of a long session where perhaps we've removed a huge, a large volume of fluid in, in that session. And I think instinctively that would be normal in clinical practice. However, when I, um, when I was invited to come and do some work with the Renal Research Institute and we, we sat down to talk about what we could look at, we, we realized that there was very, actually very little data defining when hypertensive episodes actually occur in a dialysis session. And looking at the literature, you can see that while blood pressure is pretty well described throughout dialysis and, and uh, that intradialytic hypertension is um, very closely related to, to blood pressure, um, there is very little data describing um, when the, the episodes occur. And generally, all you'll see is um, rather vague statements, such as the one here, uh, that generally suggest that hypertension occurs towards the end of the, the dialysis session. And this is intuitive. We do relate it largely to fluid removal, which increases during dialysis. So one may expect that the, the number of episodes uh, would, would increase towards the dialysis end. But this hasn't been formally studied, and uh, this is what we set out to do. So um, we, we made use of the database of uh, dialysis uh, session information from the Renal Research Institute network. We looked at 21 uh, dialysis clinics across the US. We had about three quarters of a million hemodialysis sessions and over 4,000 patients in our data set. We extracted demographic information, uh, dialysis prescriptions, patient medications, treatment data, and in a subset of the cohort, we looked at um, data from the crit line monitor, which included oxygen saturation and relative blood volume um, in a minute by minute basis. And when we, we, we mentioned definitions before, and I think it's very important in, in a study like this to be very clear about how we're defining, particularly here, the time of onset and also, and how we define intradialytic hypertension. So, for, for intradialytic hypertension, we use a number of definitions to try and cover the, uh, the array of different um, definitions in the literature. Our primary definition was a nadir-based definition. So it has been shown that um, a, a, a drop of blood pressure beyond 90 millimeters of mercury uh, has the strongest association with mortality in dialysis patients. So we use that as a, as a primary definition. Our secondary definition, we looked at a decline-based um, definition. And you can see on our hypothetical blood pressure trace here that actually when we, we move from an adhere-based definition to a decline-based definition, and we used at least 30 millimeters of mercury, um, you can change the time of onset of, of intradialytic hypertension quite significantly. The third definition we used was a combination of both the nadir of 90 millimeters of mercury and a decline of 30 millimeters of mercury. And this in some ways is going to try and remove some of the issues with each of the definitions. For example, in a nadir based definition, we, we probably are gonna include um, lots of patients with chronic hypertension as well as acute 
intradialytic hypertension. And by combining uh, different um, criteria like this, we can try and remove some of those known issues. The final type of definition which you'll see in the literature is, is much more clinical. It's around patient symptoms. And unfortunately, um, the, the database uh, would not have patient symptoms as a routine part of the data. So we, uh, we used nursing interventions as, as a surrogate measure for, for patient symptoms. We use an approach that has been um, commonly used by the Renal Research Institute um, in previous work, which is based around the administration of fluids. So um, we, we, in our data set, we removed the uh, priming fluid and the, um, and the washback. Um, we removed fluids that we related to medication administration. And then we assumed that all other fluid boluses were, um, were administered as a result of patient symptoms. And so we marked them as episodes of intradialytic hypertension. Thinking about the timing and how we define this. So we know in, in, our, in the Renal Research Institute clinics, blood pressure is measured um, automatically every 30 minutes throughout treatment. But we know that blood pressure can be measured on indication as well, particularly in relation to patients getting symptoms. So we knew we couldn't really define uh, the time of onset of intradialytic hypertension any better than uh, to having occurred in a, a 30 minute window really. So we binned the, epi uh, the episodes into 30 minute windows throughout uh, the dialysis treatment from treatment start right through to treatment end. And the objectives of the study, we, we uh, primarily wanted to just simply describe the time of onset of IDH and when it does occur. We also then went to look at uh, associations between clinical and treatment parameters and episodes of intradialytic hypertension and, and the time of the episodes. And finally, we uh, wanted to look at whether the time of intradialytic hypertension was associated with outcomes. So what did we find? Um, when we uh, plot the, the incidence of intradialytic hypertension, we are looking at here uh, the number of episodes per 100 uh, session intervals at risk. So we recorded the number of episodes in each time window and then we also looked at the number of episodes where a valid blood pressure measurement was, um, was recorded. And this defined the number of episode, uh, session intervals effectively that were at risk. So we measured the number of episodes per session intervals at risk and we've plotted these um, on, on the graph here. And what you can immediately see is that actually the, the, the perceived knowledge that uh, hypertensive episodes are more likely to occur towards the end of a dialysis session doesn't really hold up with our primary definition of intradialytic hypertension. We have a, a relatively stable rate of around three episodes per 100 se session intervals, right the way throughout the, the dialysis session. When we look at a decline-based definition, so this is a decline of 30 millimeters of mercury, the first thing you can see is that the, the incidence is much higher. So we have up to around 14 episodes per 100 session intervals compared to three with our primary definition. And this makes sense in many ways because actually a decline of 30 millimeters of mercury is not particularly uncommon in, in dialysis sessions. But again, you can see that there isn't a, a tendency for an increase in prevalence towards the end of a session. When we combine the nadir and the um, decline-based definitions, perhaps this is a little bit more what like people would, would expect to see, where we have a, a general increase in the incidence um, throughout the first sort of two thirds of a dialysis session. And finally, when we looked at fluid bolus intervention, again, we have a uh, similar rates really to the nadir and the combined definitions of uh, with a peak nearly 2.5 episodes per 100 session intervals. And I think the noticeable thing in this definition, again, there is no preference for, there is no um, increase towards the end of the sessions. And actually we have quite a steep drop off in incidents towards the end of the session. And I wonder if this is, is, is a clue really to differences in how patients are managed depending when the episodes occur. In that episodes, perhaps towards the end of a session near to the time a patient is coming off dialysis, the patient may just finish dialysis early or the 
the fluid bolus intervention actually may be then difficult to tease out from, um, from, from the fluids going back into the patient at the end of dialysis, which we removed as part of our data analysis. When we looked at association with clinical parameters, we, we split up all our uh, intradialytic hypertension episodes into those occurring in the first half of the treatment and those occurring in the second half of the treatment. So we looked at um, what factors associated with early onset intradialytic hypertension. So episodes occurring in the first half of the session. We included comorbidities, um, demographics, uh, dialysis prescription um, data as predictors. And what we found, um, <clears throat> based on the pathophysiology that we, we introduced earlier, it might be uh, expected that comorbidities would have um, featured heavily here and would have had strong associations with the time of onset. But actually, um, there was no statistically significant association between our comorbidities and um, the time of onset. When we look at the data, you can see that in the database, the, um, the, the, the number of patients with particular comorbidities is lower than what you would expect. And this is probably due to, to problems with the coding of the data. You can see in the table here, the factors that did have a statistically significant association with early onset uh, intradialytic hypertension. Some of them are as exactly as you would expect. So um, systolic blood pressure, which is the basis of um, the, the, most of our definitions was strongly associated with um, early onset intradialytic hypertension. Being prone to intradialytic hypertension, so having recurrent episodes of, of IDH, uh, these patients are more li likely to have the episodes earlier in the treatment. Many of the other factors we can actually link to, to muscle mass and, and perhaps nutritional status. So patients who are older, um, female patients, lower BMI, lower intradialytic weight gains and um, lower ultrafiltration rates were all associated, with, all of which have an association with, with poor nutritional status or, or lower uh, lean tissue mass. They were all associated with early onset intradialytic hypertension. And we also had um, higher dialysate calcium being associated with earlier onset episodes. We think this is probably linked to selection bias. We know um, dialysate calcium is, um, is, is, is probably prescribed based on uh, bone mineral disorders. And we're probably looking at uh, patients who are particularly um, uh, unstable or challenging uh, being prescribed higher dialysate calcium here. When we look at associations with relative blood volume and ultrafiltration volume, what you can see here is um, in the blue markers on the line are session intervals where intradialytic hypertension did not occur in the following 30 minutes. And the red dots uh, refer to uh, intervals where there was an episode in the following 30 minutes. So what we can see is um, there is no real difference between relative blood volume and cumulative uh, ultrafiltration volume during the first hour or so of dialysis between patients who are imminently about to suffer an intradialytic hypertensive episode and those who are not. As we go through the treatment, towards the end of the treatment, there's clear separation in both uh, relative blood volume and ultra, ultrafiltration volume. What this might be uh, indicating is that the episodes that are occurring early on in treatment may not be um, primarily volume uh, driven. So this may be linking to other factors. These could be things like systemic resistance or even um, factors relating to how we define uh, intradialytic hypertension as well. And this could be useful as we use um, um, tools like the blood volume monitoring devices as interventions to help us make better use of them and understand the best way we can um, use them to, to try and prevent hypertensive episodes. We also measured uh, oxygen saturation and you can see here, uh, we used the same technique to plot, separate the um, data into those uh, intervals where a hypertensive episode is about to occur and those where it's not. We've plotted uh, arterial uh, 
oxygen saturation for patients who are dialyzed via a fistula or a graft. And we um, have central venous oxygen saturation for those patients who had a, a central venous catheter. And in those patients, we're also uh, able to estimate the estimated upper body blood flow, blood flow which you can uh, see on the right-hand side here. And the, the data really fits with previous um, data that the Renal Research Institute has published in the, in the characteristics of oxygen saturation, at both arterial and central venous uh, throughout dialysis sessions. And what you can see is there is no real separation in, in the arterial oxygen saturation Whereas throughout the whole of the uh, dialysis session, patients who are about to suffer an intradialytic hypertensive episode have lower uh, estimated upper blood flow and central venous oxygen saturation. And this fits really with the idea that arterial oxygen saturation is really better reflective of, of pulmonary function and um, central venous oxygen uh, saturation of, of cardiac function. We went on to look at associations with mortality. Um, so you can see here kaplan meyer plots of both all cause and cardiovascular mortality. And you can see that patients who suffered intradialytic hypertension earlier had much poorer survival, both um, in terms of all cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. We also used Cox proportional hazard models to, um, to work out hazard ratios for mortality. And you can see in fully adjusted models that um, patients who had intradialytic hypertensive episodes um, earlier on in the session were more likely uh, uh, to, to die. So um, what are the implications of this work? And thinking of our analogy we started off with, um, just because we know when intradialytic hypertension uh, epi hypertensive episodes occur, just like with the appearance of the moles, there is no uh, real benefit in those being able to intervene and prevent these episodes occurring. But what, what I think we can learn from this data is that actually we, we've introduced that perhaps contrary to, to perceived knowledge, there's, there isn't a, an increase in intradialytic uh, hypertensive episodes towards the end of a, a dialysis session. And there is that, not that direct link with, um, with fluid removal, as we might have expected. But actually, I think it also um, goes to reinforce what we see in clinical practice, which probably goes often under the radar, but is a part of day-to-day -day practice in units, in that there are differences in patients who suffer episodes very early on in the session and uh, towards the end of a, a session, differences in their characteristics and also their outcomes. And, Hopefully what this can do is to support um, individualised approach to management that perhaps is, is going on already, but perhaps we can formalise this and help us to, to design and carry out interventional studies that may um, demonstrate uh, improvements in outcomes that we've really struggled to demonstrate up to now in, in many studies. What I think we can do, I think this, this allows us to help differentiate the pathophysiological mechanisms we described and, and possibly help us link the pathophysiology and the, the um, physiological models that uh, really well describe this, um, these episodes, help them to, to, to link them to clinical practice and also to databases and data sets. I think this provides many new opportunities in epidemiology. So these large data sets that we have explored uh, number, numerous times, um, this now provides different opportunities for, for further interrogation of these databases to try and um, um, develop the, the work that we present here and find out more information about what might be behind the episodes at different times during dialysis sessions. I think we might be able to have a better understanding of the differences that we observe in the definitions, these huge differences that we presented before, and importantly, perhaps help us use the, the best definitions in the best circumstances. So making better use of definitions may again help us to design studies and de design interventional studies um, to help us uh, to get positive results with our interventions and also use the best definitions for, for practice and guidelines as well. And again, most importantly, probably to clinicians and patients is the interventions. And where before perhaps we had a, 
a blanket approach to how we use the interventions to try and address um, intradialytic hypertension. Perhaps we should now start to think about a more tailored approach to the interventions and using them in a more tailored way. And this, this may well help us again uh, produce the, the positive uh, findings we're looking for. So just to finish off, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge a huge thanks to all the team at the Renal Research Institute um, who were so welcoming with me and, and, and so kind with their time and their expertise as we carried out this study, um, particularly to, to Peter Katanko and Jochen Reimann. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, a long-term mentor in Leeds, um, Dr. Elizabeth Lindley, that there are very few clinical scientists, I think, um, really embedded on real units. I'm very lucky to have uh, joined a unit where, where we had a, a fellow physicist working on the unit and who has spent 20 to 30 years um, carrying out lots of research in this area. I was funded by the National Institute for Health Research on a clinical lectureship. Um, and finally, you can see my little helpers here on the side of the slide um, when they came on a big day out to the Renal Research Institute in New York and helped with some number crunching. So I'd just like to thank you very much for your attention and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>